This episode of Baseball Biz on Deck was recorded prior to the pulse-pounding Game 5 of the World Series. By now, you know what the results were. Welcome to Baseball Biz on Deck. I am Mark Carpenter. With me, of course, is Mr. Matt Germain. How you doing today, buddy? Game five is in the works, Mark. Oh, come on, man. Game five. It was supposed to be over in four games, right? I mean, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, I would absolutely love to see a sweep. I would love to see the Dodgers sweep the Yankees and do it right there in New York, New York. When, when Freddie hit that six home run, like six World Series games in a row, he hit a home run. When he hit that one, I thought, yeah, that's going to be hard to come back from. But kudos to the Yankees for making a game of it. Anthony Volpe channeled his uh, inner New Yorker and uh, and put them on the board. And that seemed to uh, to open up the floodgates for a team that has the ability to, to score a lot of runs when they want to. Yeah, it, that's a, those type of stories are the ones that keep you interested in the game anyway. Seeing a, a hometown boy making a difference out there. But it's we'll see what comes tonight. I mean, let's see. Breaking down my little list here, the first four games. Uh, I mean, it was exciting to see, I guess, unless something drastic changes. I do believe Freeman's going to be the MVP with the impact he's made thus far. <laughs> he better be. Yeah. yeah I mean, gosh, that's insane. I On one ankle, of all things. Well, right. I mean, I don't know, think of anybody thought necessarily he'd be able to come back the way he did. Heard they were very aggressive in his treatment to getting back up there, but still, wow. And as long as we're talking about health, I know you weren't able to see all the games. I don't know if you saw game two or not, but man, seeing Otani still second and then not get up. I mean, he's tagged out and he's not getting up. And he's holding an arm and you think, oh my gosh. What does this mean? Well, you know, the good news is the arm that he was holding was not the one he pitches with. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, I thought, did he enter the other one? Was he, Is he going to be able to go to bat? Can he, will he be able to maintain his balance? But he he's right back in there, man. Yeah, you could tell there's a couple of balls he hit yesterday that would have gone out normally if he had been fully healthy. I think it's, it is sapping a lot of his, uh, his strength. Uh, so if I were him, and and I'm definitely not, um, <laughs> I I would be aiming more for line drives than than the normal swing for home runs because uh, uh, you know it's leading to a lot of flyouts. But the fact that he's in there, the fact that he's hobbling around with his arm, like you know he's grabbing onto his jersey with the left arm there, and and making sure it doesn't bounce around too much because of the pain that it causes. Um, so he's basically playing the game one handed. And, and still driving the ball to the, you know, to to the warning track, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I can remember as a kid watching Vladdy Guerrero hitting bottle caps with broomsticks. And, and it's right in that category of, of like, you're just, you're kidding me. This is talent, like beyond mm-hmm. anything. And I hope he does get healthy over time. I doubt it'll be at any point in this World Series, even if it goes to Sunday. But you want to see the best in there. You want to see them go toe to toe. Um, so I'm glad that he's, you know, sticking with it. But to be quite honest, what are their other options? <laughs> you know, when you're that top heavy and you've invested so much in the top talent, you know, the bringing in somebody else to DH is is quite the drop off. Um, so I think they're hoping that at some point he can still, you know, drive a couple of runs in or get on board a few times. He did earn a walk, so. It hasn't all been duds. No, not no, not at all. But I mean, I thought I'd really be watching him and Judge uh, a lot more. And poor Aaron Judge. I mean, last night he was doing okay, but re- the rest of the uh, postseason he has fallen short. He knew it. I mean, at one point there was discussions instead of having him uh, second in the lineup, you know, moving him up to or third in the lineup, moving him up to the top spot to take a little of the. Um, stress off of him and said, nope, nope. The captain said he wants to be right where he's at. And you think about who is it right now? They had uh, so Glaber Torres and then Soto and then Judge. And then it was um, Stanton. The change they made the other day was is they moved Jazz Chisholm up in the Stanton's place. But 
the first three guys in the lineup, they didn't change at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I, not sure I understand that part because to me, World Series, especially when you're down where they are, Glaber Torres is not an optimal leadoff guy. Uh, I would have slid both Soto and Judge into one two spot. I don't care what order they put them in. I want to get those guys the maximum number of at bats. Mm-hmm. And and like I had to remind somebody on X yesterday that you know this guy uh, Judge hit three twenty two with fifty eight home runs this season. He he knows how to get himself out of slump, and that was after a terrible start. So I I. Hot streaks are going to be part of baseball. Cold yep. streaks are going to be part of baseball. To me, the best way to get him out of it is to get him more at-bats. And you're right. Yesterday, his at-bats were much better. Uh, he was seeing the ball more. He had a better plan. He wasn't um, overly aggressive. And I think that's been his major you know, hard point. I think Aaron Judge, regardless of how he looks, how big he is, I think he's putting a lot of pressure on himself to not only – you know, be of impact for the for the Yankees to win a World Series because he he knows he's getting up there in age, and so are his teammates that are <laughs> the core. Um, so he's putting a lot of pressure on himself for that, but also to show that you know Soto isn't the be all end all of the future of the Yankees. That he's going to be a major part of that. I think that in his heart, even though he'll never say it out loud, is what's driving so much of that pressure, and and, and it's having an impact on his at bats. So, you know, the best piece of advice most managers would give somebody like that, and it's it's the easiest thing to say, the hard, hardest thing to do in this situation is to just go out there and have fun. Yeah. Like, play the game the way you know how to play the game. Stop overthinking everything and just go up there and take the one at bat and focus on that one at bat. I presume that's what indeed what Aaron Judge has done because, like you said, he's starting to get better at it. He did, he did look like, you know, when – I remember when I played golf for a while and I would come up to the ball and I would swing like I was going to kill that thing. And mm-hmm. of course, you know, real crappy shot from that. But the thing that was, um, I was trying too hard and mm-hmm. was not getting the the uh, contact that I wanted. And certainly with Judge, it looks like he wanted it so hard that he was going to swing hard at it no matter what. But he's balanced that out as of last night. So I'm really curious to see here tonight, game five, how it's going to play out. Ooh. Yeah, there's going to be a, a lot more pressure on the on Dodgers right now because, like you said, they're banged up, right? Like they Freeman and Otani are both banged up. Um, they're not going to feel any better through this series. <laughs> if anything, they're going to feel harder because there's not that many games or days off between the games now. Um, it's pretty steady play. Uh, and and the pitching matchup tonight, I mean, you have Jack Flaherty against Garrett Cole. Mm-hmm. That's clearly in, in the Yankees' favor, uh, assuming Garrett stays uh, stays healthy and, and has a good outing. He's susceptible to more home runs now, which, you know, uh, maybe Freddie hits another one out and makes it seven in a row. But uh, but I think, you know, the, the Dodgers are opening the door a little bit to, to keep, let the Yankees come back in, assuming – tonight Jared Cole's able to pull it out and and lead the Yankees to victory they're down 3-2 so yeah. at that point you know it's a two game series um <laughs> it, it, i don't want to say anything can happen cuz winning four against the Dodgers is pretty hard to do um but worse teams have done it i remember i think the Oakland A's did it this this year or last Right. And and so it can happen. And especially if you know if the A's can do it, then pretty positive the Yankees can do it. Jeez. Um, but the fact that some of those games would have to happen in LA to me is the kicker. That's the part where I'm like, I don't think I believe that part. I think they would be able to figure out a way to to pull one of those out. Um, so regardless, I still envision the the Dodgers winning it. So uh, let's assume that's true. What does that mean for the Yankees who, if you, if you look at the their 2025 season, they have five players that are going to make $150 million between them. Uh, that's uh, Stanton, who will be 35. Mm-hmm. Uh, Judge, who will 30, who'll be 34. Um, Cole, who will be 34. Uh, Strowman, who will be 34. And yeah. Rodon, who will be 32. You know, they're not going to get any better. A lot of them are looking long in the tooth when it comes to the pitchers, especially. So what does that mean for their core? So if you're starting a team with that, 
Yes, you have some youthful talent. You have Dominguez, you have Volpe, you have some guys coming up behind them that are intriguing um, who will be able to take some of the pressure off of those core guys. But you're starting to see cracks in the armor of a pretty formidable you know, team that was supposed to to kind of uh, at least win one championship for you know the last five, six, seven years. The pain has to be there, especially with these old man geriatric group that's playing for the Yankees and, and pulling down that kind of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I don't know how Cashman's going to do what he's going to do. And you figure that Soto's up next year, free agent. He, will he want to stay in New York? If so, does it the Mets talk to him? And I don't know. But coming back to the game itself, yeah, it's it's tough when you look at these gentlemen. You can't expect the same thing from them as you do the young bloods that mm-hmm. – uh, and I mean, glad, obviously, some of the younger guys, especially the pitchers, don't necessarily have it all figured out. They may not have a full retinue of pitches that they can deliver, but powerful young batters. And I'm going to go out in left field here, but talking about somebody like even Xavier's outside of this universe, but bringing him back in, looking at young talent coming up. And, and I haven't seen the Yankee system to know what they have in the pipeline. Um, they have a, I'd like to call them, I, I was screaming for the Rays to draft them when they uh, when they ended up. I think it was the year they drafted Xavier Isaac. So let's just say I'm okay with it now. <laughs> I get it. I get why the Rays went that route. But at the time, I was all in on, on a guy who's exactly the same size as as Aaron Judge. And I'm pretty sure that the, the Yankees are molding him to be the, the same kind of hitter at the plate and also the same kind of fielder. They have a lot more pitching that people would anticipate um, they would have, even though they've lost a lot of guys through trades, a lot of guys through Rule 5. They they were peppered with guys getting taken off the board. <laughs> um, but they still have guys like Will Warren, Cody Petit. Um, you know, they some way, somehow... Their development of their system in terms of pitching has improved uh, beyond the point of just being average. They're more of a well above average at this point in, in terms of uh, developing their own pitchers. So that's that's where I would say that they have a strength and an out. But as we've seen with a lot of young pitchers, there's no guarantees. And especially no. when you're talking about the Yankees. So Spencer Jones may come up and be... A very Aaron Judge like, uh, but he he's not going to be able to pitch, as far as I know. <laughs> and and you can have as good a lineup as you want. Uh, and and just so you know, like this guy's you know he's six foot seven, about two hundred and forty pounds, and uh, and he steals about twenty five bases while while hitting above twenty bases uh, home runs a year as well. He's got a really good eye at the plate. I like him a lot. I think he's he's going to be a beast of a player once he figures it out. Um, but the Yankees are not like another example I'll give you is is Ben Rice, right? He came up, he did very well at the beginning of the year. Was I think he he overachieved for what people had in terms of expectations. But it was a, an encouraging thing that the Yankees used to win a lot of games early on in the season or you know, in the first half of the season, but then he had a terrible second half and he ended up not being on the roster for the world Mm. series as an example. So the Yankees, they tend to lean a lot on bringing in guys from elsewhere. Like they did with Verdugo, like they did with Trent Grisham and a lot of other guys, because they know the pressure to perform in New York and the media and everything else is unlike anything else. Um, So they lean a lot on that and I get it, but (laughs) <laughs> when when you start paying guys long term deals like they did Aaron Judge, like they did DJ LeMahieu, like they did, um, you know, um, uh, Jared Cole, you're you're making yourself susceptible to having dud contracts a little bit in the same way as what the the Angels have done, not to the same degree because they did so many of them and all <laughs> with hitters, but you're you're make opening the door for having some dud seasons or dud stretches where you really can't patchwork your roster unless you spend $400 million. Jeez. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous when you put it like that, but the Yankees are going to have to figure out like, just as, as an example, like you said before, they have to replace Juan Soto and Glaber Torres this off season. Right. And that's two of the top, their, their top two hitters in their lineup. Right. Right. 
right. And then they have Anthony Rizzo they're not very happy with. So you figure they're going to want to do something with that. Whether they move Aaron Judge to first base or not, I still think that's the answer. They're not listening to me. But <laughs> I'll put some put other people in the outfield that are younger, have be, yeah, you know, better legs before he gets hurt. They still have DJ LeMahieu on the books. They still have uh, Nestor Cortez that they have to figure out. The rotation is going to be a mess next year. I don't even know where they're going to start uh, in order to shore it up because they have guys signed that are, I don't want to call them subpar, but if you're aiming for a World Series win, then you want more than that. That's all. Like, I honestly don't know what to think of the Yankees for next year. All I'll say is that if the Orioles are to spend the way they should spend to sub to to add to what they have in house, they should be the favorites again next year to win the AL East. You know, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see how they're going to spin and see what that mm-hmm. what that team looks like because I don't know. I really am. I, I shake my head. I think because Soto seems like such an essential key part to that team. And Volpe is really, sh- you know, he's shining during this postseason. But I, I don't know. I mean, you're talking about these old men, <laughs> and it's like they're going to be injured more. And mm-hmm. Stanton, I just, I don't know if he, how much longer he's going to be able to be out there. But uh, I, I, another thing though, too, when we're looking at this from the Dodgers' perspective, let's let's talk about pitching for a moment, Matt, because let's see, Dodgers, we had Flaherty, Yamamoto, and Bueller. Those were the three starters. Then here you are, a team that has all this money, and you don't have a fourth day pitcher and a fifth day pitcher. You got a bullpen pitching on the fourth day, man. I mean, you get Flaherty back for your fifth day, but our fifth game. But my gosh, I mean, who is it? Kershaw's sitting there in the uh, dugout and Tyler oh, yeah. Glass let's now. Go, let's go through their IL. Okay. So we've okay. got Tyler Glass now that's out with elbow tendonitis. Uh, You've got Tony Gonsolin, who's out with Tommy John. Clayton Kershaw has a toe inflammation issue. He's not going to be back. Dustin May is a flexor tendon surgery. He's been out the majority of the year. River Ryan is another guy, Tommy John. Emmett Sheehan is another guy with a Tommy John. Gavin Stone, shoulder surgery. I mean, you talk about the Rays went through that this last year. Mm -hmm. And and it's one of those years where, you know, they, they brought in guys that I thought we're going to have more of an impact that like guys like Bobby Miller um, and, and they, they have Nick Frasso, a, a couple of guys that you could have dreamed on to, to actually have a big role in the world series. But the truth of the matter is like, you just stated right there. You only need three starters in the world series. <laughs> you don't really need more than that, to be honest, as long as you run your pen the right way and you give guys the, 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 the days off that they deserve and you have two inning relievers in the pen that you can actually lean on to, to eat up some innings when you need them. Uh, that's what I think if you listen to uh, the commissioner talk recently uh, through this World Series, they're trying to address it. They're trying to not force starters to go a certain number of innings and do that kind of stuff. But it's such an effective strategy, especially when when the other team isn't as familiar with the pitcher as they otherwise would be. Uh, they don't get to see that pitcher a second time. They're always seeing new guys. Uh, it throws them off their game, and and it's to the point where you can actually you know earn a lot of wins that way because they're not able to capitalize on some of your weaknesses like they would somebody that they see more often. Um, so the the Dodgers have figured that out, and and they know that you know lineup wise and defensively especially they're better than the Yankees, uh, so they're able to actually. Um, you know, do a little bit with less. Uh, I don't think they went out and got enough at the deadline. I, I'm with you. Like they, they should have gotten another starter. And I think their job this World Series would be easier if they had. But I get like how many injuries they had is just ridiculous. <laughs> it's to the point where you're looking at your training staff going, okay, boys, like what, what are we doing right now <laughs> that we need to change? Because this can't keep happening to our, you know, whatever, $400 million roster. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the old sc- scouting tale, you know, if there's, if you have talent, they'll find you. Well, there's, there has to be more talent that they can bring up. There's, there has to be something that's not being seen. And there, I, I'm also kind of going off on a tangent here too. When we talk about having 
enough pitchers? Do we expand the roster by two people and allow each team to have two more pitchers than they do just so they can have uh, maybe a little more arm health? I don't know. Uh, I like your idea earlier this year. You talked about the six-man rotation, and I think that's an essential piece that teams long-term need to look at. But right now in this World Series, this three – <laughs> this three-man bullpen rotation, it, you know, it looks like it'll probably work. I'm really look, curious to see how Flaherty and Go do tonight. You know, an interesting piece of information that I wanted to add also that I heard during the broadcast was that Brent Honeywell volunteered to throw pitches uh, in, I don't know how many he threw, but apparently it was a significant amount, uh, to Mookie Betts because Mookie Betts was struggling during the Padres series. Hmm. And, uh, and and apparently it got him right back on track and it kicked off what has been since then a better playoff. And all of the players were raving that Brent Honeywell was willing to do that at a time when he knows that he could be called upon to, to actually, you know, perform in games and yada, yada, yada. And that it was going to, you know, put a lot of pressure on his arm. He was willing to do it because he knew the stakes were high and he wanted to get Mookie right. And, uh, and it, it speaks to what kind of teammate he is yeah. and knowing, you know, what it takes to get yourself in that situation to perform at a high level. Um, he, he didn't want uh, to not take that opportunity, I guess. Um, so I, I tip my cap to him. And I think th those kinds of stories is what I wish we would hear more about. I'm sure it happens hundreds of times that we don't hear anything about, but uh, just a little nuggets that like that, that, you know, during the the playoffs you hear and you're like, wow, that, that's pretty special. Well, anytime you hear a story about a selfless teammate who gives in a situation like Mr. Honeywell did there, I mean, yes, it's encouraging. It, it shows the true nature of what you'd hope sports is going to be. And I mean, working together as a team and sometimes maybe I won't say injuring yourself, but giving of yourself to, for the betterment of another. And I mean, it sounds like that's what Honeywell did with bets. You know, I, I don't know if you saw this or not, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but when you brought up Mookie Betts, made me think of something else. I saw him, Post game yesterday, and people were asking him regular things about the game. And then uh, the other the thing they wanted to ask him about too was about the yo yo out there who uh, grabs a ball and the glove and everything out of him, the, the Yankees fan. And to Mookie's credit, he said, That's not relevant. We lost. He said, That's what's relevant. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, Aces. Okay, man, Mookie. I thought, Good for you, brother. Good for you. It's one, he, he's an athlete with the focus being on making sure one, understanding what the heck happened out there, and it doesn't have to do anything with that one instance. He says, you know, this isn't about anything. And my, well, he didn't even get into more detail than that. He just pretty much said, it's not relevant. And yeah. they asked the him last, if he was okay. Yeah, the last thing they want to do is to give the Yankees ammunition by, you know, by talking about the fan and, and being – uh, you know, calling them out for for being that kind of fan. Oh, that's what you can expect at Yankee Stadium, which is what <laughs> you heard a lot of, on X and elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's hilarious because you know what, Mark? It teaches you a little bit about the world. Yeah. I guess Yankee fans were going up to him and asking for his autograph oh, Lord. and have pictures taken with him. And I was like, oh my God, this is just... <laughs> This is one of those situations where you just realize how outlandish sports are and, and how ridiculously seriously some people take it. Uh, you know, it, it's it's to the point where you're getting autographs of fans that that through that did what some would call a stupid thing. Yeah. <laughs> and and really, you know. Uh, I don't know what he paid for the tickets and, and what he had paid for this game, but apparently he's out for this game as well. Um, so he's cost himself a lot of fandom uh, opportunities. And and I just think it's, you know, it's a lesson for a lot of other fans and especially younger ones and older ones that might have acted in a similar way to, to think again, you know, they could try to, to be a better fan. I think the fan who does that kind of activity, it's, they need to have a strong punishment for it. I'm, I'm at least saying a person should not be in any ball stadium next year, all of you know 2025. Mm -hmm. And 
maybe there's some probably feel that way about life with both of those guys up here. They do. I get that because it's not something that should be celebrated, that kind of behavior. If we start that, it's a dark road to go down. I mean, it's it's, it's the gateway bad behavior drug. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. But I said I didn't want to focus much on it. I just primarily wanted to say I wanted to. Uh, I was really happy to see how Mookie handled that situation. Mm. It's like next, you know, let's move on to the next game. So we will see. Mr. Cole takes the mound tonight. The Yankees have got to have a lot of juice rolling right now after winning game four. And I didn't realize, Matt, I was wondering how many times there have been a sweep in the World Series. You know, there's 21 times that there's been a sweep. My gosh. It's quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and other. Hmm? I didn't realize it was that many. Yeah, and of that twenty-one times, the Yankees were what? Oh, t -t 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 eleven. I think eleven times, and they swept eight themselves, and they were swept three times. Yeah, wow. So the twenty-one, they're almost yeah, a little over half of all the World Series sweeps involve the Yankees. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So I wonder if you look at all the series in a season on average, how many of them are sweeps? I'd like to dig that. That's a good one for a future show. I want to dig that up. Because how similar is it than the Yan the Yankees, the World Series uh, percentage of, uh, of, of series that are sweeps? Like maybe it's just a baseball cyclical thing more than anything. Sort of like if you roll dice or if you flip a coin, how many times is it going to be heads or tails? <laughs> Man, it's, I think, you know, statistics in baseball are so much fun. And there's so many playoff stats that have come out of the limelight. And, and especially with Freddie Freeman, six games in a uh, six World Series games in a row, hitting a home run, you start to realize, you know, how, uh, how rare some of these statistics are once they do <laughs> come out. And, uh, and so apparently sweeps are not that rare. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 21 sweeps, man. That just kind of knocked me down. I I didn't anticipate say, anticipate seeing a number that high. I was surprised even to see it went into double digits. But and I wanted to ask you about the the performers. What did you think of the difference between Ice Cube <laughs> and Fat Joe? <laughs> like and 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 where is it going to go to next is what I want to know. Oh. Like and is this team driven? Do they pass it by Major League Baseball? Is there any like just because I'm 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 comparing it to what happens at the, the Super Bowl, and I'm just thinking like first of all it's before the game ever happens. Yeah. Like, isn't the seventh inning stretch a better time to have <laughs> this kind of thing? Like, I don't know. It, it's one of those things where I get what they're trying to do. Personally, I think if you do that, they should have a concert from that individual after the game as well. So sure. You want to go spit some lyrics at the beginning of the game before, you know, first pitch? Sure. But at the end of the game, I want to see some bling. I want to see you put on a show uh, because I gave you that opportunity, gave you that stage, and uh, and it gives the fans a little boost of something extra for the ridiculous amount of money they pay for the tickets. Um so, yeah, I, I think that's the next step for Major League Baseball. I don't mind it. Like, yeah, people talk about Ice Cube being so much better than Fat Joe in terms of the <laughs> performance, whatever that is, and the crowd being more into it. But, you know, they can figure that out over time, how they want to do it. But I think the intent and the, the potential is what's interesting about that whole situation. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because when I heard Ice Cube – I thought, okay, are we trying to find a younger audience? I said, I remember Ice Cube, you know, a couple of decades ago, people. You know? <laughs> and, but uh, I, I love him. Don't get me wrong. I love him. But I thought, who, who's the audience we're going after here? And when he was doing his bit out there, he had basically the full echo and reverberation of the Dodger Stadium. And it's like, yeah. oh, it, I don't know. It, it's It struck me as as weird because I thought, why couldn't you find somebody who has appeal maybe to a younger audience? It was my first thing that went to with that. And I like the idea of maybe they do come out and do two songs this also in the seventh inning stretch. And then they, they have a post, uh, post game concert that, that, that like I said, as much as they had to pay for those tickets. Yeah. Why not? Why not? But <laughs> fat Joe, <laughs> 
Oh, gosh, man, when he got up there saying, I wasn't sure if it was him or if it was Memorex. <laughs> I thought, are you lip syncing this? It just, the effectiveness or the, the quality of the performance was better than me, <laughs> but not yeah. necessarily by much. So here's what I want to put out there. Okay. Let's say next year the Detroit Tigers make it in the World Series. Do you have MNN do this thing as as an example, right? Mm -hmm. So who who's the main artist in Atlanta? Like who's I also think in New York I would have put the Wu Tang Clan in there instead of Fat Joe. I think it's a wider audience and and much better music. But but I I think that the potential is so huge in terms of the wide variety of artists. And a lot of times when you look at the Super Bowl. They bring their friends. They're not alone. You just assign them, you know, okay, put on a show. And then they they select the whatever set that they want to do with their friends and everybody else. So um, I think it just would bring a lot more eyes on the game if they announce it ahead of time. First of all, it's not a surprise. <laughs> they promote it correctly. And, and they actually set things up to have a, a big bang at the end and then people can keep watching, you know, if they want um, once the game is over. So um, I don't know. I think the marketing wise baseball has had a really hard time to, to get its feet under it. They got it right with the, the field of dreams uh, thing. I think this is the next step. This is like making the playoffs relevant for baseball is a huge thing. New York, uh, Los Angeles series, is is a good you know uh, way for for baseball to test that, and I think that's what the Ice Cube and Fat Joe thing was really, and and I don't know like let's say it goes game six or seven, you know they're both going to be in L.A. So who do you get to play you know in front of those fans while the pressure is mounting and everything else? It'd be interesting to see. Okay, you know who they got to sing the national anthem right now? Game five is getting ready to start. Who's that character? Is it baby face? Oh, no <laughs> way. I'm not watching it. Oh, wow. Baby I'm face. Put that on. <laughs> He's up there singing the national anthem. <laughs> oh, man. Come on. I kid you not, brother. Uh, I, well, oh, my. <laughs> maybe they went to, to the Steinbrenners and they said, listen, who do you guys like as artists? And yeah. then they, they're just spitballing things and. Yeah, here's the mixtape. Here's the mixtape Dad made me for me 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Find, find an artist from there. <laughs> See yeah. what we can use. Oh gosh, I don't know, man. It's it's funny. It's, phew. but I tell you, it, when this before this began, I'm seeing two Goliaths, and I'm thinking, oh great, that's just going to be boring as hell. But I have to say, it has been great to watch this, and of course, you and I haven't people that we like on the Dodgers as far as former Rays, that's been a big part of it through the interest. And with me, there was also my connection with Louisville. And I looked at, or Louisville, as us natives say, and, and Will Smith, who grew up in Louisville, went to University of Louisville, and uh, Walker Bueller, who is from Lexington, Kentucky, and went to Vanderbilt, I believe. But, you know, there's always connections you can find out there. And, and to me, that is, and the the great team that the Dodgers have and the many Rays that that are on that team have definitely made that the one I'm cheering for this year. Yeah, it's uh you're right. Like the personalities, like there's no there's no like severely hated person on the, on either team. Uh, I think there, you know, there might be some that somebody likes less than others. <laughs> but uh but I think there's uh there's a definite heavier tilt towards the Dodgers, especially if you are a Rays fan or um, even the, ex, let's say the Red Sox fans. I'm sure there's a lot of them that still pull for Mookie. And, and the fact that he's up against the Yankees is just a big <laughs> bonus. So I think if you went across America and you asked them, you know, who do you, would you prefer to win if you had to to choose one? I think the majority would still say the, Do the Dodgers. And uh, it has a lot to do with how likable a lot of those players are. Is there a player that you look out there on the, during these last four games and they had a moment and you said, oh, man, I, I'm sorry, dude. I was really sorry to see that that worked out that way for you. 
I have to say Shohei, like the 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 whole slide. Uh because I do I know he wants to perform at his best and the fact that he can't actually show the world now that he's on the biggest stage in the biggest series he's not able to perform at his best and so people are not seeing um the best version of him and they've been showing like how insane the coverage is in Japan for these world series games and they they want to see the best of Shohei and they want to see themselves represented in 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 the best way he knows how to do and and so he did that during the WBC he's done it in other environments but i think in this one especially when it went as you were saying before being judged against otani uh and that's really how a lot of people i think saw the series even though juan soto was sitting right there <laughs> but people still saw it as judge against otani so uh I, I think that would be the one the other one i would say if i had to pick another one uh would would just be you know the 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 whole, um, what do you want to call it? Uh, underrated <laughs> aspects of Kike Hernandez's game. So I think it seems to me like year after year after year after year after year after year after year, Kike Hernandez goes into the playoffs and performs. And if you look up his stats, it's insane how just steady this guy is, the, wow. regardless of what team he's playing for. If you look up all his uh, playoff statistics, um, he is a guy that you want on your team when you get into the playoffs. It doesn't matter who he's playing for. He just shows up. And, and yet he gets zero recognition. <laughs> he really <laughs> does. He's like if Randy or Rosarena had been ignored during the Rays you know, 2020 playoffs, that would be Kike Hernandez. Hey, Hernandez, well, you mean Tiaster, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he gets so, lost. He gets lost behind Tiaster. That's what it is. <laughs> it is. I don't get it, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I think those would be the two that I would point out. What about you? Oh, yeah. You know, the one I felt for, and, and it was uh, Nestor Cortez. Well, is he going to be able to play? Well, uh, you know, even if I hurt my arm, I'll come out when they need me and I'll make a difference in. You know, the first pitch he throws and bam, Otani gets it, goes all the way. And Verdugo lunges, you know, over the embankment to catch the ball. And that's it. And Otani's out. And he said, okay, okay, Nestor, I get it. And then the next one, the second pitch, guess what? Home run and it's over. But that was a grand slam, wasn't it? Yep. Oh, my gosh. So, Nestor, I, I felt for Nestor because I felt like all the, the hype about – him being able to come in and, and make a difference. I felt like the weight was really on him for that. So I would say that was probably where I, I felt uh, the most difficulty for a player. And then game four, I was, I could think of, it wasn't necessarily an individual person, but looking at all those pitchers that were coming up in that bullpen, I was thinking, yeah, you're, you're good, but you're a reliever, you know, at, at best you're a reliever and you're not a good, you're not the final reliever. You're not the closer. And they just, I felt like, I don't know if they had the confidence that was needed to beat the Yankees last night. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, you know, let's, let's take a step back here. The game's going to start here in a few minutes. And I do want to point out, I mentioned before about See Her, Be Her, that the uh, documentary from on from grassroots baseball gene fruth put together and some others and it was great what i was able to get to see of it it was on the mlb network on the between game two and game three however i don't have mlb network and i had to rig up something here on my computer where i could try to get it that way i wasn't able to see it all but it looked like a really great documentary and here's the thing though matt a film like it should be a film. That documentary should be a film. And on the uh, on the MLB Network, they put advertising in there, which is to be expected. But it was the start of advertising where it butted up right next to whatever was playing. It's like in mid sentence, almost you would hear what uh, somebody talking on see her, be her, and then the uh, the the spot, whatever the advertising would begin. It's like, well, wait, wait a minute, is, am I still in the show? And that's th little things like that. Of course, you know, I'm real 
persnickety about that anyway. But the show itself, what I saw of it was great. And I'm I'm hoping I'm going to see it again. I spoke with some of the folks from grassroots baseball and they said, yeah, they're trying to find a place where they can stream it. And once they do, they'll get that information out there. And there's so many different women they have on there. Like some of the ladies who've been here too, like Veronica Alvarez, who's a coach with the Oakland A's organization. And also is the, you know, the coach for the United States women's uh, team that, they play this year up in Canada and let's say bell Blair from the all American girls professional baseball league. So when that comes back out again, I'll make sure everybody knows about it. Almost immediately thereafter, maybe 24 hours later, there is another organization that's been around for a while and that's baseball for all. And that is uh, Justine Siegel. And she's one of the first women coaches in MLB. She has also done a lot to, Make sure women have a place to play baseball. She's put together tournaments throughout the year and inviting different women teams to come, and they do round robins or or, uh, that sort of thing. But she's also done a lot to develop some uh, college clubs, some women's college clubs, which I want to learn more about too. But her and another gentleman by the name of Keith Stein have put together this new organization. It's called the Women's Professional Baseball League. And I I want to see this happen, but I haven't seen much as far as the meat and potatoes of it yet. They put out a press release, and I'll share more with you all on that later, but it is still seems like in the gross stages, if you will. I think there is support behind it. I'm just not sure where it's going to be. So hopefully I'll get Justine and or Keith on here. Let's see real quickly. Uh, they'll rewrite history by creating an elite league that provides the world's best female players with the platform they deserve and serve as a catalyst for the creation of a women's baseball culture in America. Well, that's part of the, of it there to see there, da, 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 da. but there is a note in here too, talking about still, I think how they're going to broadcast this, that it's not just going to be something where you have to be in a stadium to see them. So. Good times ahead, I hope, here for the Women's Professional Baseball League. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. Let's see what's to come, my friend. I'm still curious to see how quickly their funding avenues will grow. So for all the, the women's leagues, whether it be soccer, basketball, or now baseball, you get to see how much growth uh, the WNBA has you know, been, been able to garner over the years. To the point where you, you can say they're they're a very strong league, and and one day could challenge uh, some of the men's leagues uh, in terms of revenues. Soccer is is growing, we all know, in North America, and it already is the number one sport around the world. Right. So, well, how much of of headway can can baseball make? And and what's interesting about this, and, and this is what I'll say, they're coming up at a time. When baseball is redefining the way that they're broadcasting things, and they're some would say that they're about to take more ownership of that and and have more control over it directly. Um, so you know they've already brought in the minor leagues in, into that umbrella. Uh, whether if you're getting MLB TV, you automatically get MILB TV, um, so you get to watch all the minor league games. So is there an avenue for the women to get involved in that as well and get some revenues and improved access to things, especially technology-wise, that they don't have to build their own platforms, for instance, um, and they can kind of share the stage uh, with the other baseball avenues? That's, you know, my mind goes there just because I know how hard it must be for them to to kick things off when, you know, the attention span of people is already <laughs> being stretched thin and, and and there's a lot of noise out there so it, it's hard to get yourself heard when you want to be well and you bring up something too about having you know i think a national exposure instead of just having one officer having to build something with yourself when it becomes to uh be able to promote our market or stream or whatever because it's so diversified where we all have to spend our dollars these days to to, to see the games that we want to you know and and even when things were going on with the uh, women's baseball tournament up in Thunder Bay in Ontario, I'm trying to find where to watch that. If I didn't know people to talk to, I don't know that I would be able to see it. So even though it's something as big as a 
international championship, there's got to be a way to market this stronger together. And all these organizations and, and this, even this uh, upcoming Women's Pro Baseball League, they're going to have to find a way together that they can boost their presence. And I'm not saying you all have to go down one channel, but you got to find a way to really support one another. And let's see, I'm looking here. It says they plan on securing a national broadcast deal for its inaugural season, which will consist of a regular season playoffs and championship throughout summer of 2026. Uh, the WBPL will be a national league with teams based across the U.S. for the 2026 season. The WPBL will launch with six teams predominantly in the Northeast. You know, the, the thing about this, too, it sounds a lot like what Susan, Susan Pay was putting together. So I'm, I'm curious if there's any kind of working together. We'll find out more later on. Yep. We'll keep tabs. That's right, brother. That's right. Well. Looks like Gary Coast taking the mound. So maybe we'll go ahead and say goodbye, everybody. And we'll come. Is there any other goodies we need to to touch base with, my friend? No, no. Just the uh the Arizona Fall League is still going on and the guys are still doing well. Um the Australian baseball league's about two weeks away from starting. And uh Shohei Otani did not listen to my advice. He popped out the first uh first pitch of the game. Damn. <laughs> Damned. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, we got to get you on a conference call with those folks. Uh, <laughs> I'm fully on board with that. As long, right. as, I, as long as nobody hears about it, I'm happy. <laughs> All right. Matt, thanks again, buddy, once again for being here. Matt and I always are happy to have you here on the show and love talking all about baseball. And God knows there's been plenty. Anyway, thanks again, Matt. Not a problem. Always a pleasure. Well, if that's it, let's go ahead and give her a wrap. And uh, thank you, everybody, once again for joining Matt and I here today on Baseball Biz on Deck. And we look forward to talking with you all again real soon. Special thanks to x Tech RUX for the music rocking forward. Remember, you can find Baseball Biz on Deck here. You can find it on Twitter. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on Spotify and wherever you look online, we're there. <laughs> I'm ready, baby. All right. Enjoy the rest of the week, everybody. Special thanks to X-Take RUX for the music rocking forward.